I am Hannah Grant and I am the Head of the Secretariat at the Access to Insurance Initiative. The H.Y.I. together with the IAIS um, regularly organises webinars for supervisors to learn from technical experts but also from each other and stimulate conversations about implementation practices. Today's call is the second in a three-part series on pandemic risk and exceptionally we're actually holding this call in a public forum. This is in recognition of the fact that to close the pandemic risk protection gap, all insurance st stakeholders need to work together to develop solutions. Um, on the first call, which was held last week, um, we had representatives from the World Bank, African Risk Capacity, Asian Development Bank, and the United Nations Development Programme, as well as learning about the initiatives they had underway to help COVID-19 recovery efforts. We also learned about their plans for better great integrate insurance into their efforts in the future. Notable to me was that although all institutions are involved in supporting short-term recovery efforts, except for the World Bank Pandemic Emergency Financing Facility, none of these initiatives actually involved insurance. Rather, the emphasis was on providing budgetary support to governments and public financing of immediate relief efforts. With respect to better integrating insurance into efforts to build greater resilience in the future, just to mention a few of the key messages that came out of last week's discussion, um, there was a need to better understand the clients and design products to meet their needs. I think particularly here it was around sort of SMEs and better understanding the needs of, sort of small enterprises. And also the need to think beyond just pandemic risk and consider the protection gap more broadly. The next crisis will be different. The important role that the insurance sector plays in risk mitigation and modelling as well as risk transfer also um, came out and how an enabling regulatory environment is critical for deepening financial inclusion. And finally, which brings me on to the topic of today's call, the risk of big catastrophe events like COVID-19 is too big for the private sector or public sector to bear alone and therefore there is a need for all stakeholders to work together to jointly develop solutions. The recording of last week's call is available on the A2I's website and also on our YouTube channel. So I'd encourage you all to take the time if you weren't on the call last week and, and listen in. So on today's call, um, we will discuss public-private partnerships to address the protection gap. And then we actually have another call next week, um, the third and final webinar in this series. And this will be a supervisor dialogue focusing on the insurance supervisor's role in working with other stakeholders to close the pandemic risk protection gap. Um, just a few sort of quick housekeeping points um, before we get on to the main part of the call. Um, firstly, please be aware that this webinar is being recorded. Um, you're all going to be placed on mute to improve the audio quality of the call. Um, we encourage participation and we've actually reserved 15 minutes at the end of the call for sort of question and answer and discussion. Um, but please submit your questions through the chat function. This call is also being simultaneously translated into French and Spanish um, and we are using a simultaneous interpretation platform called Interprefy um, for this. You can access Interprefy in two different ways. One through an app which you can download onto your smartphone. Alternatively, you can listen through the web and there are instructions on how to do this um, in the chat function. So if you need more information there, please just have a look at the chat function. Um, before I sort of get on to um, or on, get on to Connor to give his welcoming remarks, we actually want to do a very quick poll to see who we have on today's webinar to try and understand better what the balance is between sort of public sector and private sector representatives. Um, and we'll actually also do another poll at the end of the webinar to get your feedback um, on today's event. So my colleague Carolyn will now launch the first poll and you have two minutes um, to respond to this. Carolyn, um, please go ahead. Yes, so the poll is now opening. I see some results are coming in. Perfect. I think actually a minute might be enough, Carolyn. I don't know if we can change the the time allocation, because I think later on we're going to probably be quite tight for time. Yes. Or if we can just pull up the results, maybe.
that we're waiting in suspense. <laughs> <laughs> the results should now be up, I think. Okay, perfect. So we have we have an even split between the three different categories, um, the industry, and then secondly, regulator supervisors. And then we have a few from the other categories as well. So, and it's a majority supervisors, which is actually what I expected. So I think that gives actually a very interesting cross-section of who's on the call. Um, and a good representation, I think, also for this type of discussion today. We've got both the public sector and the private sector pretty well represented. So with that, I'm actually going to hand over to Connor Donaldson from the IIS to make a few um, welcoming remarks. Thank you, Connor. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah, and thank you very much to the A2II team for convening today's call. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joined in. I hope that you, your colleagues, and your family are keeping well in these challenging times. I'm very pleased to be here today to offer some brief welcome remarks on behalf of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors for this second webinar exploring pandemic risk. We are all aware of the severe human and economic costs caused by the pandemic and by the measures authorities have taken to try to control the spread of COVID-19. It is clear that the impact of the pandemic is multidimensional. It does not discriminate between high and low income populations, but the effects are disproportionately felt by low income populations who do not have the same resources and ability to cope and recover. Early on in the pandemic, we partnered with the Access to Insurance Initiative on a series of webinars that provided a platform for supervisors to exchange views on prudential and conduct of business implications of COVID-19 on the insurance sector, with a particular attention to the situation in emerging markets and developing economies and the effect on vulnerable populations. The crisis has highlighted the limits of the types of coverage that the insurance sector can offer alone and the importance of exploring new approaches, such as public-private partnerships to pool risks, which can help to close the protection gap. If we do not take action, the protection gap will continue to grow and global disparities will increase. However, taking steps to close the protection gap is a complex task that will require a multi-stakeholder approach that brings together supervisors, consumers, the private sector, and policymakers. The importance of finding multi-stakeholder solutions is why the IAIS and the Access to Insurance Initiative have invited all interested stakeholders to participate in this webinar so that we can learn from each other and explore new and innovative approaches. During today's webinar, we'll have the opportunity to hear from a range of excellent speakers representing public-private partnerships, the private sector, and international development organizations and to hear their perspectives on responding to the crisis and ensuring greater resilience in the future. I encourage colleagues who are participating in today's discussion to make this a ro robust exchange of views by joining the discussion during the Q&A section. While the recent months have been a demanding period for all, I'm very pleased with the speed and breadth of the response by the insurance sector and insurance supervisors to the impact of COVID-19. Moreover, I'm incredibly impressed with the commitment and remarkable ability of our stakeholders to rapidly adapt and respond to the challenges during this difficult period. I hope that in the not too distant future, we have the opportunity to pause and reflect on the positive changes that have resulted from the global community of insurers and supervisors coming together, learning from one another, and ultimately finding ways that we can come together to help close the protection gap. Thank you everyone from the IIS for participating today and for your continued support and engagement. Hannah, back over to you. Thank you, Connor. I would now like to introduce our speakers um, before we move on to the presentations and panel discussion. So we have an excellent lineup um, for you today. We have Ekushwe Ihan who is the Secretary General of the Insurance Development Forum, which is a public-private partnership that aims to enhance the use of insurance to build greater resilience against disasters and to help achieve the United Nations Global 2030 Agenda. 
Before joining the IDF, Equishwe was directly involved in establishing and operationalizing two pioneer initiatives, the African Risk Capacity, who we had the CEO on from last week, and the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. We also have Oliver Milos, who is an advisor with GIZ. He is responsible for conceptualizing and implementing climate risk insurance solutions in India, contributing to the Insure Resilience Global Partnership. Prior to joining GIZ, Oliver worked in the private sector for Allianz. We also have Julian Enuisi, who is the CEO of Pool Re. He has presided over many things, um, including the purchase of the world's largest terrorism retrocession retro program, the launch of the world's first terrorism catastrophe bond, and a significant investment into a partnership with the Home Office in respect of risk mitigation projects. And I also have John Huff, who is President and CEO of the Association of Mutant Insurers and Reinsurers. John directs the BIA's worldwide public policy initiatives and has more than 25 years of experience in the insurance sector, most recently as the 2016 NAIC President and as Director of the Missouri Department of Insurance, a position he held for eight years. I think you'll all agree that we have an excellent lineup and a great opportunity to hear from the private sector on initiatives underway and what they need from the public sector in order for them to do their part in helping to close the protection gap. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Ekwishwe for her introductory presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Hannah and Connor and, and others who are on the line and also the fellow speakers today. Uh, I must say it's really an honor to be here to be able to, to speak uh, on this theme. But importantly, I am also here in, in the spirit of learning <laughs> from all of us around this table, because I think that there has to be an acknowledgement that we don't all have the solution. This is a complex issue. And so this is really about fostering that exchange that will allow us to help or allow us to begin to craft the kind of solutions that are needed. Um, so there are a number of points that I was asked to reflect on. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a presentation, so I'll get right into it, um, which is that I think that the experience of COVID-19 has obviously revealed uh, a lot of things that we already knew <laughs> and allowed us to acknowledge the fact as you mentioned, Hannah, earlier, the deep resilience gap, the deep protection gap that exists. Uh, I think many of us on the call have been involved in discussions in one way or another for decades around this issue. Um, we've also been involved in many ways to craft what we're talking about, which is different types of public-private partnerships to help to address some of these challenges. Um, but COVID has obviously revealed that it's not enough, and there is an urgency <laughs> that we need to move with in terms of actually um, developing new kinds of solutions. Um, we've seen real deficiencies in terms of existing social safety net systems, which are going to have to be a critical part of how our governments, how our societies respond to risks that will become more frequent like this. <laughs> um, we've also seen really profound deficiencies in terms of financing. Yes, there has been a lot of effort put in by the multilateral, by, the, by, by governments, et cetera, to mobilize resources to respond in the short term. Um, but there are real questions about where is that money going to come from in the medium to long term? What are the systems that we need to be able to have within our respective countries, jurisdictions, communities, et cetera, that will allow us to sustainably finance our recovery, our response to these events, and to just be more resilient? So, from my perspective, I think that this is a, a remarkable time for us to, yes, reflect on what we have achieved, but also to ask critical questions of why haven't we done or achieved more, right? Um, and what do we need to allow us to, to kind of cross these barriers? Um, obviously, from the looking at it from the insurance industry perspective, I will also say that the issue of pandemics is, nothing, is not new per se. There was a report issued by Switri in 2007, and probably Julian can reference other reports that predate that, speaking to pandemics as a real threat that people should and governments should be taking uh, more seriously. But clearly, there wasn't necessarily an appetite for that conversation at that point in time. But 2020 is a different time, and that's why we're all um, around the table. And I think and I hope that part of the silver lining is also an openness and an awareness of the complexity of the issue, but the fact that we do really need to move urgently and together to address this. 
But the impact of COVID, as was mentioned, uh, the, prof the, the impact has been most severe in terms of the economic side <laughs> of this issue. Um, and this has come from the sudden administrative closures, the confinement, the halt in economic activity. And we've seen a rippling, not only in terms of governments, but households, communities, loss of jobs, loss of livelihoods. Um, and so the questions are really on a multiplicity of scales in terms of looking at this issue and how we are, we are, we are crafting solutions. The sheer scale of this global in nature, which brings issues of you know, correlation around the, the particular risk. Um, but again, highlighting the point, it's not something or the solutions are not going to sit within the remit of the private sector or the remit of the public sector alone. There's also the added dimension, which is that with the pandemic, there will be eventually a vaccine found. <laughs> Being an optimist, <laughs> the question will be, you know, how quickly can we roll that out to the communities and people that need it the most, right? Um, what is that going to look like in, like in terms of access? But it's not the only risk that we face. Um, cyber, climate change, there are no vaccines. <laughs> Um, we also exist in a world where we are seeing, uh, we are hurtling towards more toward a three degree, four degree world. What does that look like from a, a development perspective? What does that look like from a financing perspective? What does that look like from an insurance industry perspective? And so these are the questions that I think that all of us here need to be asking if you're from the private sector, if you're from the insurance regulatory office, um, if you're from the development in development uh, kind of um, institution, the donor community, um, is that we are dealing with complex issues here, multiplicity of risks, and at the same time, really constrained financing. And so the question of what or the rule, where, where does insurance fit into this is actually uh, quite an important one. The IDF itself was launched in 2015 out of precisely this recognition within the insurance industry and also in the interactions that we had with the public sector that you know, we have the sustainable development goals. And across the sustainable development goals, they also represent risks. <laughs> and these are risks, again, that the insurance industry can have and is already in some way um, having a, a, a very active or intervening in some way to these issues, you know, in terms of addressing these issues. But again, to the point of urgency, to the point of scale, to the point of innovation, to the point of new solutions, right? It also meant the need to craft an institution where the industry could corral its position in terms of having a multiplicity of voices at the table to speak to these issues, but really finding a way to have that engagement in a structured way with the public sector. So the IDF was launched at uh, COP21 in Paris in 2015 as a public-private partnership led by the insurance industry, but co-chaired with the World Bank and the United Nations Development Program and really as a platform to allow public sector institutions, private sector, civil society, acad academic institutions to be part of this collective to begin to think through these issues. And we have five working groups which we have identified as core areas where we felt that there was a real need for focus and um, value add that the IDF could bring. And these range from risk modeling, the need for open risk modeling uh, systems and frameworks to allow for better risk insights, directly related when we look at the pandemic, the need for better understanding of what does this mean for us? What are the impacts? How do we model it? How do we understand it? How do we translate that information to policy, <laughs> to action? Um, this is the kind of work that needs to be done. Um, but we also have a working group that's focused on, on regulation, laws, uh, resilience policies. So if we look at the insurance industry and the role that it can play, it also means that you have to have a robust um, regulatory regime to support that, that is very much focused on the interests of the consumer, but also can facilitate the development of a sector that can contribute to development. <laughs> and this is where I think that our partnership with the A2II and others is really critical because it's also about sensitization of what are the needs of the private sector of the insurance industry from a regulatory perspective, but what are their challenges as well for those of you who have the mandate to actually address these issues within your, your specific jurisdiction. What are the areas where we need um, further conversations and action to understand how do we begin to, to make progress in this, in this arena? The two other working groups that we have, which I think are also particularly relevant, are, are, are focused very much on developing real solutions. And one of the things that I, I, I would like to emphasize is that, uh, and I alluded to it in my earlier, in, my, in the beginning of my statement, which was that 
we've had a lot of discussions for a very long time, and there's a need for continued discussions, but there's also a need to focus on what do those solutions look like? Why are we not getting to scale? How do we bring together the necessary expertise to begin to develop what these things could look like, right? What are the barriers that we face? And so there are two working groups that are really focused on developing solutions. One is the inclusive insurance working group, but also the sovereign and humanitarian working group, which is developing solutions at the sovereign level. And again, the relevance to COVID, when we look at the kinds of risks that we are seeing, it's going to require collaboration across countries, possibly, right? Development of new kinds of risk pools. Um, within countries, yes, what are different kinds of innovations that are, that are required? So I would say that, you know, for the IDF, this is an active space for us. It's an opportunity for learning. Through our working groups, we are considering how can we bring to bear the experience of COVID and offer what we have learned to the broader conversation that our membership and activities that our membership is engaged in. But we are also very acutely aware of the fact that there are these other risks like climate, which was really an entry point for us into this space of public-private collaboration. And how do we also maintain an eye on that because we need to, <laughs> because this experience that we are, we are going through with the pandemic has highlighted what we have been speaking about for a very long time, but it is not the, it's not the start and it will not be the end, right? Um, and so there is a need for us to also maintain that big picture of climate risk. What are the opportunities here to learn from the response to COVID that could also be relevant in that context um, and vice versa? So. I will stop here for now because I know I have, a, um, I, I'm more excited about the other speakers to hear their perspectives. But I hope that that offers a little bit of room for reflection. But importantly, I think it's really a call for greater collaboration and partnership um, across maybe some might not see as traditional partners, um, but which we, our time demands it. So that's really the spirit within which I, 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 I've made my interventions, and it's really to listen and to learn from all of you. So thank you very much, Hannah and, and Connor and others for this. No, thank you very much, Echo Shrey, and that really sets the scene very nicely, I think, for the discussion we're going to have later on the call. Some tough questions there, though, as well, which I think we can all work through um, together. But no, thank you for that. So to add a bit of um, country context and a concrete example of a public-private partnership under development, I'm now actually going to hand over to Oliver Milos from GIZ, who's actually going to do a short presentation on the GIZ NatCat insurance pilot in India. And he has a few slides which are now up on the screen um, to support the presentation. Thank you, Oliver. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Hannah, very much for giving me the opportunity to present our intended solution to the audience today. And I would also like to take the opportunity to send out a warm welcome to every participant. Um, what is it that I'm going to do within the next couple of minutes? So firstly, um, I would like uh, to show you what are the problems that we would like to address within this project. And secondly, um, I would then show you the major building blocks of our intended solution, as well as the roles of all the stakeholders involved. Um, one thing that I would like to highlight in the first place is that uh, our project is fully committed to contribute to the Insure Resilience Global Partnership. And as a consequence of that, we have fully incorporated the pro-poor pro principles uh, into our project work. So that we really meet the needs of the poor and vulnerable people. Um, now moving on to the next slide, um, in order to get a better understanding about uh, the problems that we would like to address, there is a mapping uh, of the hazards India is facing. And if you look at the right hand side of the slide, I think it already becomes very obvious that uh, India is facing a very diverse set of hazards, not only the climate induced ones, but also the geophysical events like earthquakes. Um, and I think the numbers on the left hand side of, of the slide, they already speak for themselves, right? It's quite dramatic how many people are being exposed to these natural hazards. Uh, how many uh, economic loss um, these uh, uh, natural hazards have caused, and most sadly, I mean, how many people have died uh, due to these natural catastrophes. But um, now, thinking about the pro-poor and about the poor and vulnerable that I have mentioned before, 
and what is the situation they are actually facing on the ground. And if you look at the next slide, um, I would say that uh, these poor and vulnerable people, which you mostly find in rural areas in India, um, what are their occupations? I mean, some of them are active uh, in the agricultural business. And you could ask them, okay, is there already some kind of insurance protection available to them? And the answer is partially yes. Because uh, if you are uh, a guy uh, active in the agricultural industry, if you have a land certificate, then you are also entitled to receive payouts of the large, uh, out of the large public uh, insurance scheme, which is called GMFDY. But most of the people in India who are cultivating the land are not necessarily the ones who, who have also these land certificates. So um, the other group uh, of people uh, that we consider as the poor and vulnerable, and they are active as, as unskilled laborers in the construction business or uh, are micro entrepreneurs. And this customer segment uh, is mostly served by microfinance institutions. Their core business is to hand out group loans to these people because these people normally don't qualify uh, for a regular loan with, with a bank that they don't have any collaterals to show. Um, so what is it that these people are uh, doing when they are uh, facing a natural catastrophe? So they uh, apply most of the time these negative coping strategies. What does that mean? Um, they sell income generating assets like livestock. Uh, they take out their children out of school to save school fees. Um, and these are uh, uh, the negative coping strategies they apply in order to protect their credit history because that's their major source uh, of, of uh, uh, getting cash. Um, and um, one other point that I think is very characteristical for the situation on the ground, um, these MFIs, um, they uh, have faced these extreme weather events in the last 20 years. But I mean, climate change has significantly changed the picture on the ground because these events become more frequent, more severe, and especially also uh, more unpredictable. Because you have certain areas within India who have not been exposed to uh, uh, floods in the past or have not been exposed to droughts in the past, but now these phenomenons happen. So therefore also the MFIs have, an, have exposed or have uh, articulated the need for an insurance protection. So therefore the objective of our project was to inject certain innovations into the Indian market. Um, and they are targeted towards uh, extending the class of beneficiaries beyond farmers who are normally only entitled to receive payout out of PMFDY, introduce new insurance coverages um, that provide a very holistic coverage to people and also to introduce new technologies that improve the access. But now let's have a look at the major building blocks uh, of our intended solution on the next slide. So in terms of beneficiaries, as I said before, uh, our solution is being designed towards the MFI clients, but also uh, 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 these, the MFIs themselves. Uh, in terms of perils covered, uh, as I said before, I think it's uh, very much needed to have a very holistic protection. And uh, due to the fact that India has a very wide range of natural catastrophes, uh, we have four perils that are being covered by our insurance solution, namely drought, cyclone, flood, and earthquake. Um, how does the insurance coverage look like? So we are not offering an asset protection here. We are offering a loss of income protection, which uh, would um, which would uh, provide um, at the maximum uh, free loan installments to these MFI customers as a maximum protection. And the other point is that MFIs could buy a portfolio insurance. Um, in terms of the underlying methodology, uh, it's a purely parametric uh, solution. Uh, and we are making use of technologies like automatic weather stations, seismographs, and especially satellites. I think that is the innovative component here and is based uh, on work that we have jointly done with the German Aerospace Center. Um, uh, we have four regions uh, where we would like to pilot the solution, and this all already um, takes into account 
the necessity of sort of certain risk diversification. Um, what is the purpose of the pilot? We would like to optimize the product concept, but also the operational model before we are able to enter in, into the scaling phase. And what is very important to GIZ is that we would also like to introduce very sophisticated awareness campaigns in order to improve the insurance literacy with these two and vulnerable people. So last but not least, I would like to give you an overview on the last slide about the stakeholders that are being involved at this point in time. So um, could, could we move to the next slide? So here you can see the, the lineup of stakeholders involved. And um, so far, I think it's a purely private driven exercise where we have Empton as a society who will advocate the solution towards its members. We have these NFIs, we have the company like Swiss Re and the primary insurer, uh, primary insurer Chola and S. Um, GIZ is on board. We have Weather Risk Management Services who will act as a data service provider. We have IRDA who will be responsible for the approval of uh, the product concept. And I think the important message here at the end of my presentation is that we have also started to engage with the private sector, who has already addressed an interest in our activities. Because in order to close the protection gap, I think it is necessary to integrate such a solution also in big uh, government schemes like social protection nets that have been mentioned before. So therefore, there is a certain interest with public entities to step into. And um, yeah, we are, we are very confident that we are able to start uh, this, uh, this pilot within the next couple of months after the situation, the COVID situation has been uh, uh, under control or more stabilized in India. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver. And I think that's a helpful example of how uh, well, a private sector driven initiative, which is now then looking for public sector support, but just showing again how very practically it's addressing a need on the ground, but then also showing the different stakeholders involved and how you need to bring this whole coalition together in order to produce that end result. So I think we can definitely draw some lessons out of that for our discussion today um, on COVID-19. So with that, I'm going to move on now to our expert um, dialogue. Um, and we here have John Huff, Julian Enwise, and I'm going to welcome back again Ekwishwe Ihan again to to join our, our expert panel. So firstly, um, we're going to sort of look at the, the current pandemic and the role is insurance is playing in the immediate recovery efforts. And then the second set of questions is more going to be forward looking and um, ways the insurance sector can address a, a potential future crisis. So John, if I um, turn first to you here. The Bermudan I mean, reinsurance and insurance market is a world leader in dealing with climate catastrophes, but the current pandemic is a little different. How have your membership responded to the current crisis? How have they been able to help policyholders um, deal with the consequences of COVID-19? Well, Hannah, let me first thank you and the um, um, Access to an Insurance Initiative and the IIS for the invitation to be here. Uh, this is, the, I think, the number one issue for us to start exploring, and for many of the reasons already said, not specifically for pandemic, but for uh, these significant clusters of issues like climate and cyber. So I'm thrilled to be here, and I hope this uh, kicks off a, a very robust dialogue. I'll make one point from the, your initial survey. Uh, I wish we had more government representatives um, because sometimes people confuse insurance supervisors and regulators with the government, and in fact, sometimes the policymakers are removed. And so, one of my ask at the end are going to be to, for supervisors to try to be more engaged in those public policies, uh, public policy descriptions. So, how are they, how are uh, my members dealing with the um, uh, crisis at hand? First of all, we represent about 35 percent. Our members do 35 percent of the global PNC reinsurance market. So, we're a significant hub. For, for reinsurance, we're very active uh, in the insurance development forum and working with Ekoshwe in the in the multiple uh, work streams. But the first the first job at hand is really dealing with um, the the existing uh, COVID-19. I know this webinar is treating uh, is looking forward for prospective pandemic, but just like any significant loss, um, companies are taking stock of their languages. Because we're re, uh, predominantly reinsurance, they're looking for asymmetrical coverages. 
So where there may be some underlying coverage uh, in the primary policy, but lack of coverage in the reinsurance um, contract or, or vice versa, which is a very important aspect to look at. Um, and then really what are they doing right now? They're paying claims, uh, which is, um, and setting reserves. Uh, you just saw yesterday a global reinsure set a significant first half of, of 2020 uh, number for claims paid and incurred uh, uh, about 2.5 billion for one company. Uh, this will ultimately be the largest insurance event in history. Um, and so the perception that some of the public has that their insurers are not paying, it's the, the data doesn't support it. But it does support telling us as an industry, we have not done a good job of telling our story um, of the value proposition of insurance. Um, and what, when you ask what we're doing, we're, I think what the industry is doing is recognizing there has to be a better way forward uh, to address a future pandemic. Thank you, John, and I completely agree with the point you're making there about the industry's reputation not reflecting actually what's happening here, because there are a huge amount of claims being paid out, but if you pick up the newspaper, that's unfortunately not the headline. So it's a good point and something we all need to vocalize a bit stronger. You know, the best uh, estimates, uh, we may not know exactly, but the best estimates may be uh, between 40 and uh, one out, uh, outlet did a $107 billion cost of the event. So this is a significant event. Yeah, wow. Julian, now over to you. Um, I think a lot of people maybe on the line won't be so familiar with Pool Re. So if you could first start by just telling us a little bit about how Pool Re is structured and actually why it was set up in the first place. And then obviously looking at the current pandemic, I mean, did you have any pandemic products that, that paid out for the crisis? Okay, and, and uh, just add my thanks for the uh, invitation to participate. Uh, I think it's an extremely valuable uh, thing to be discussing. Uh, to give you some perspective on, on Pool Re and just some of the comments, if I can, on that have been made so far. So Pool Re, uh, much like what you're seeing today, uh, was born out of a market failure, an inability for the market to handle an event uh, due to its size. Um, and therefore, the insurance industry uh, and the reinsurance industry withdrew from providing coverage, in our case, uh, in the uh, area of terrorism. Um, and so, you know, there, therein is the first parallel. And I think one of the things I always sort of try and distinguish between is that when you are forming a public-private partnership, and Pool Re is a public-private partnership, in other words, um, what, what Pool Re is, is a reinsurance company, um, but, but with one slight difference, or one huge difference, I should say, to other reinsurance companies, is that in the event that its assets are exhausted, uh, it has the ability or it has a, a revolving credit facility with the government uh, so that liquidity can continue to be pumped into the market. But it's not a reinsurance contract. And in the event that we did draw on government funds, we would then have to repay the government out of future premiums. And so what the government has is a distribution mechanism to pump liquidity into the economy very, very quickly. And it then has a recoupment mechanism to then be able to re regain those premiums out of, uh, few, sorry, regain the money it's pumped into the economy from future premiums. And from that then stems a whole load of policy issues like affordability of the product, whether it's a risk reflective premium, whether it's a mandatory product, et cetera, et cetera, which I'll come back to. But the point about it is, is that it's a big difference between a catastrophe loss, which the industry is perfectly capable of dealing with, versus a systemic loss, which the industry cannot deal with. And I think that's one of the, the, the primary points that I would draw out of what I've heard so far, is that distinction between kind of almost existential issues versus catastrophe loss, which the industry deals with extremely well and deals with it every day. And part of that is driven by modeling and the inability to model some of these events. Um, and again, 27 years of history, 17 different events, one and a quarter billion uh, of payouts, sterling payout, uh, teaches you that you are able to get better at modeling over time because you can certainly today do something that you couldn't do 27 years ago, and that is you can blast model. You can model the impact of blasts in a way that we couldn't 27 years ago. And we can not only do that on a 2D basis, now a 3D basis, now on a computational fluid dynamics, the modeling's got better and better. What we can't do is predict frequency. And in order to calculate a risk reflective price, you need frequency and severity. And I think, again, 
these are all similarities, I would say, uh, with the current system of, of COVID. You asked if we've paid out on COVID. No, we're a terrorism reinsurance. However, had COVID been something that was man-made and launched by a terrorist, then we would have been paying out for that. And that payment mechanism and recoupment mechanism would therefore have been uh, triggered. And so obviously in the early days of this, we were certainly looking uh, to see whether or not this was um, something that had been triggered by a terrorist, for example. And clearly since then, there's an awful lot of analysis going on about what does uh, this teach us about biological terrorism or, or radiological terrorism, uh, which you saw in Salisbury a few years, a couple of years ago. Oh, sorry, it wasn't terrorism, but it was a radiological event. This wasn't terrorism, it's a biological event. Where does that leave you uh, in, in your learnings? And, and a number of other things um, which I'll talk about, but perhaps I'll, I'll hand back to you and then come back to some of the other observations uh, at a later point. No, thank you. And a very scary thought, the idea of biological terrorism on the scale of COVID. But I think that also resonates with the point we had on the first call about the next crisis or the next catastrophe will look different. So we need to Absolutely. think quite broadly about the solutions. And yeah, I look forward to coming back to you later on to sort of use, get your ideas from the development of the terrorism pool and think how that maybe could be applied in a, in a pandemic situation. So the only um, public private partnership which has paid out for COVID-19 actually, which I'm aware of, was the World Bank's pandemic emergency facility. However, um, particularly actually in the last few days, it's been heavily criticized in the press. Um, questions have been raised actually as to whether a scheme like this is needed in the first instance whether it's just more efficient to disperse capital and loans after an event. With regards to the product itself, um, there have been criticisms on the triggers used for pandemic bonds and the resulting timeliness of the payout. It has also now been announced that the facility will be discontinued. Um, given sort of the, I guess, the, the relevance of this in the press and things at the moment, I'd be very interested actually in the, the speaker's reactions um, on this. And also, actually, if you are aware of any other pre-existing public-private schemes that have actually have paid out for COVID. Um, maybe this time we start with Equishway. I'll bring you back into the dialogue. Thank you, Hannah. I, I will add the caveat. I do not know the details of the program. <laughs> um, I'm aware of it, um, so just to be clear on that point. Um, but I do think from the little bit of informa the information that I, I do have, I think what it points to is um, a need for greater understanding <laughs> in terms of the structuring of these kinds of products um, and these kinds of um, tools that we're seeing emerging. Um, I do think that perhaps in that process, there could have been greater awareness or education associated with um, that product, um, not only in terms of, I mean, public awareness of insurance, its limitations, um, but also looking at in that particular program, there are different players in that mix, taking different portions of the risk, right? Um, and who takes what portion of the risk? So I'm making this point to say that, again, to the earlier um, theme or the theme of this discussion, which is that you do have interesting models arising in terms of how governments, institutions can structure solutions. Um, but these solutions also have terms and conditions associated with them. And so there's also an education element that needs to go alongside the development of these products and awareness as well. And part of that, I believe, is also understanding the various terms um, associated with that contracting um, process. But I would say again, with the caveat that I don't have as much insight into that program, but I assume that that's part of the, the constraints that we are seeing. Thank you, Ekoshe. Um John, do you have any comments you'd like to add as well? I share Ekoshe's uh, um, caveats. I, I was not familiar or, or involved in the, in the program. But I will say that if you look at the press reports on on the issues, one was the building of the trigger reserves, um, and probably uh, was not. Um, it was based on historical events, um, but it probably didn't address some of the most important aspects, which was the second issue, which was liquidity and the need for uh, cash to move quickly. Um, and so when you're waiting, waiting for triggers, and I think the trigger was either deaths or infections in a certain number of countries. Um, it, it was, um, I think it was frustrating for everyone involved uh, with kind of a, a feeling it was going to be triggered eventually, but there was a need to start moving cash. So that was just my outsider uh, perspective. 
Thank you. And I can see Julia nodding, actually, as you're mentioning about the need for cash to move quickly. I think that also goes to how you described terrorism. I mean, the pool we set up before. But is there anything else you would like to add? Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's, it's, you know, I, I certainly don't want to criticise the, the World Bank product. I think, I think, you know, in hindsight, you look at something like that, I forget exactly what it was, was it 300 million or something, which, of course, is just a, a, a drop in the ocean when you think about what we're what we're dealing with here. So to me, the, 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 the learning from that and the fact that they're not offering it again um, is that you've now got a number of problems, not least of which is governments around the world are now the largest insurance companies in their own domestic territories. Mm -hmm. To go from that to a position where you're now going to persuade people to purchase an insurance product to cover a future pandemic is going to be really hard because they are now saying, well, why would I buy an insurance product when the government's going to bail me out? So that's one problem you've got. Um, that then leads to the relevance, continued relevance of our industry, because if we cannot provide product, if in other words, post an event, we stop offering a product, well, then what's our relevance going forward? And we've got to work out how we can offer these products. And I question whether you can now sell somebody a non-damage business interruption product for terrorism, for pandemic, for cyber, for climate change, pick any other systemic event. And whether or not we're not better off looking at that overarching structure that offers you a, a product which is going to be peril, not, not looking at the peril, but looking at the, the issue of non-damage. So that's another issue that I think we're going to have to uh, deal with if we want to remain relevant uh, as an industry. Um, and again, I'll, I'll stop there. There's so many <laughs> different comments you can make on it. No, thank you. And I think some interesting thoughts there about yeah, improved product design and also communication clarity on what the product is going to deliver and how it structures. So I think that was also actually a, a problem um, with the potentially the World Bank product because there's been a lot of lack of understanding, I think, in the press about what the actual triggers were. So now we're going to move on actually to the second part of our discussion, and this is really looking forward and looking at building resilience for the future. I think we've already made a few sort of hints in this direction. But um, Julia and I will start with you actually this time. And does Pool Re have any initiatives underway which could help to improve resilience against future pandemics? And maybe a secondary question sort of linked to this. I mean, what needs to be in place for the private sector organizations like Pool Re to provide greater support against future pandemics? Uh, wow. Um, so, look. I guess. I guess that. Look. If you if you take nation state, and I'll comment. I'll limit my comments to the UK. John, I'm sure, can talk about what's going on in in, in the states. There are obviously multiple issues and different initiatives going on around Europe, etc. Um, but if you just take the UK, um, insurers, I think, uh, are, are realizing that in order to be relevant, they have got to come up with some kind of suggestions as to how they can help going forward. And certainly Poolry as a disaster risk management structure uh, is one that is being looked at as a possible solution. And that could be uh, whether or not that is just to simply house alongside of the terrorism structure, a pandemic structure. Um, we are very definitely of the view that it has to be public private partnership, that to simply offload this risk onto the government and expect them to just write a blank check is the wrong thing to do and that we need to find a way that the private sector has skin in the game. And you mentioned earlier, I think you used the expression of coalition of stakeholders. Well, that begins with the policyholder and the policyholder's excess. Uh, it means that the insurers have got to have meaningful skin in the game. It means the reinsurance industry has got to have skin in the game, the capital markets, whatever pooling mechanism you design. If, if this turns out to be, let's say, a one in 20 modeled event, and how much money can you gather in a pooling mechanism uh, over, over that period to sort of form a buffer between all of those different layers and then the government? And then how do you build risk mitigation into this? Because whilst it's unreasonable to expect the average citizen to, uh, to, to, to take mitigating steps, there are going to be mitigating steps that are going to be developed, whether that's you know, making sure that you take your annual vaccine uh, or whether it's ensuring that your business is able to operate in a different environment. So um, if you are unable to access your premises, you may still be able to offer your services in a different way. So all, all of those things have got to be considered. 
there are a number of initiatives in the UK, Pandemic Re, which is the sort of Stephen Catlin uh, initiative. Uh, Lloyd's has launched something called Black Swan Re. Uh, there's an initiative called Totus Re. And certainly Pool Re, I think, views itself as a platform that could have a broader application than just terrorism. The model works. In 27 years, we've paid out on losses. We've never called on the government or the taxpayer. And therefore, we think there is a model there that could be used to go beyond uh, terrorism, but also beyond pandemic and into what I would call that those broader systemic risks, whatever they may be in the future. And John mentioned cyber, and he and I have had many conversations about that. Um, because where he talks about climate, and again, I think these are all systemic as opposed to cat catastrophic risks, and we have to deal with those differently to catastrophe risks. You're on mute, sorry, Helen. Thank you. Um, John, and also over to you to hear about um, initiatives underway in Bermuda to help um, build greater resilience. Right. So the good news is there are many initiatives going on globally. So um, uh, Julian mentioned some of the work going on in the UK, uh, Europe. I, uh, we had a, we a member webinar with uh, Gabriel Bernardino last week, and he talks about um, uh, the resilience work that's going on and the potential for prospective pandemic. And of course, in the U.S., there's a variety of different plans, which I think is a very healthy dialogue We're talking about the pros and cons of each. But because in Bermuda, we really are guests in every jurisdiction. Our companies do business in 150 countries. So we're really uh, giving uh, opinions when asked, but it's really going to be down to jurisdictions. And that's why the work with the IIS is going to be so important to try to get some common taxonomies. Uh, we're preparing, APR is preparing a, a group of guiding principles, if you will, sort of a wish list of how can we do this in the most coordinated way, but still um, uh, respecting local jurisdictions and their unique needs. Um, I, I think there's a common consensus that the extreme tail risk, risk that exceeds the, the insurance private sector market capacity has to be dealt with. And so that maybe puts us in a forced marriage of a public-private partnership. Uh, that where that issue of deciding whether it's appropriate or not is really already off the table. We know the capacity is not there for uh, particularly the private sector to handle some of these tail risks. Very important issue is correlation of risk. Uh, our market is able to handle some natural catastrophe risk. Uh, we just recently paid in the last couple of years about $9 billion on California wildfires, uh, which allowed us to also pay over $9 billion on Japanese typhoons. Because those, list, those risks are less co correlated and it allows us to diversify. The pandemic doesn't have that luxury. And so it is something that uh, the coordination among the jurisdictions is going to be so key and critical. Um, the um, uh, one thing that, uh, that is very important to do right now um, is because the markets really had a, a double whammy, if you will, it had a, a pretty strong attack on market valuation. On the asset side, it's, it, it is much improved at, uh, through second quarter, uh, but then also have the liability side that we spoke of. So one of the key attributes for the market to, to really engage in now is making sure the capital is in place uh, to keep our markets resilient. And it, it has, appears to be the analysts are telling us it is a good time uh, to raise capital to make sure we keep that resilience. Thank you, John. And in just a moment, I'm going to turn to the questions that are coming in, coming in thick and fast through the chat function. But I've also actually had an offer from, I think it's the American Property and Casualty Insurance Association, um, because they are working on a business continuity product. And I think it'd be interesting to hear a little bit about that product that they're working on there. So I don't know if, if Steve, we can have your microphone unmuted yeah. and you could tell us about the venture. I think it is, Anna. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, well. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everybody. Thanks very much for just giving me a couple minutes. I'll, I'll be very brief, but um, this has been a fascinating conversation, and I think that a lot of the thinking that we've been doing at APCIA and within the U.S. insurance industry um, bears on the topics. And we, we started from the position, and I think everyone would agree with this, that pandemic risk is essentially uninsurable on a math basis in CNC insurance. 
Um, so our conclusion coming from that and the research we've done is, is that uh, addressing pandemic risk in the future is going to require um, a national level government solution that provides enterprises and, and businesses um, with an efficient mechanism to receive government support in such a national crisis that may occur down the road. Um, we, we don't believe that pandemic risk is amenable to a terrorism-like program such as TRIA. Uh, so we support the creation of what we're calling the Business Continuity Protection Program, or the BCPP. Um, and I'll just mention the, the primary elements of the BCPP, which would be uh, a government subsidized revenue replacement program designed to secure wide business participation. Uh, two would be a, a protection for up to 80% of business losses uh, limited to a spe specified operational and payroll expense for up to three months. Uh, three would be a, a parametric trigger resulting from a state ordered government closure of businesses within a designated industry um, in combination with a federal pandemic emergency declaration. And fourth and finally, I would just highlight that the, the BCPP, as we've designed it, would have um, a payout system that would ensure prompt payment to distressed businesses um, within a short timetable. Um, so thanks so much, Hannah, and, and to all the speakers for giving me just a couple minutes here, and uh, thank you again for the discussion. No, well, thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention. Um, that was, I mean, good to hear a variety of different initiatives underway all around them globally. So it's, it's great that we're managing to connect these together as well, I think, on today's call. So I'm now going to turn to some of the questions um, coming through the chat function. And I have a question um, from the Bank of Malaysia for Julian to Paul Ree. So Paul Ree was recently expanded to cover cybersecurity. Is it likely that Paul Ree's mandate will be expanded to cover pandemic risks? And how would its balance sheet or premiums charge to its members be modified theoretically if Pool Re is also to cover pandemic risk? Uh, well, I think I might get lynched by the British Treasury if I were to answer that uh, <laughs> completely openly. But um, look, I mean, it's, it's no secret. It's under debate, right? I mean, um, and actually, not only was our remit expanded to cover cyber terrorism, but it was also covered, expanded only a year ago to cover non-damage business interruption. So that is probably even more, I think, salient as a point, because now all of a sudden, most of these pooling arrangements around the world rely on physical damage. And we're now in a world where we're not seeing physical damage as being the major trigger to these kind of losses. So to have expanded our cover to cover non-damage business interruption is probably even more relevant to your question. Um, the, the, answer, the, 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 the answer to your question would be, it is under debate about whether or not Paul we would have a broader remit um, and you know whether or not as, as I said earlier that you would you would sort of design a pandemic solution uh, akin to the one that you have for terrorism and you just heard the intervention from the APCIA saying that in in their model in the state trio which is a very different model they don't believe that a terrorism model uh, is appropriate for uh, pandemic, and I think that is the the industry debate that is now raging. You've got a polarised industry, half of whom are saying this is too big for us, this is uninsurable, this is an issue for government, and then you've got the other half who are saying we need to be really careful before we vacate this space and say we can't do this because what are we going to do when science, systemic cyber attacks happen, or you know you've got a climate event, so we're just going to keep vacating these spaces and leaving to them to government. And where is the relevance of the industry uh, thereafter? And so I think that debate is, is happening around um, the world. And so the question then becomes whether or not you can produce a risk reflective price. And of course, you cannot produce a risk reflective price for any systemic event. You will only know what the price is after the event. And so all you can do is to continue to con enhance and modify your skills in terms of modeling an understanding of risk. 27 years ago, the understanding of terrorism risk was precisely zero. Today, we have a very, very good understanding of terrorism risk. It is the same today with pandemic. We have a very limited understanding of that risk. But if we vacate the space, we will always have a limited understanding of it, as opposed to finding a way to partnering with governments. Because otherwise, somebody picks up the bill for this, right? It's either small businesses or it's the taxpayer. So somehow we have to, I believe, inhabit the space, but that's a personal opinion. 
So, Hannah, I may build on, on Julian's comments. I, I see what's going on in the states right now a little bit like a, a political primary, if you will, where everyone wants to go in a generally uh, directionally one way, it's the details of how we get there uh, and who will succeed. And I, to be honest with you, I think there's so many areas for compromise uh, that it will be a very robust dialogue. Julian's pointed out some of the main uh, characteristics that help the camera out. Uh, how much will the insurance industry be risk bearing in, in, at the end of the day? How much will our skills and expertise be used uh, in this entire process? And whether the programs will be voluntary or mandatory? Um, and uh, what, what are policymakers looking for in terms of uh, any financial um, uh, offloading from their ultimate cost of the program? And those are very worthwhile discussions to have. And um, it, it will be, uh, I'm happy to see so many ideas in the market right now. Mm -hmm. Hannah, I'll also add, Hannah, um, I just, alluding to, yeah. uh, just alluding to a point that was made by, by both John as well as Julian, of, and to your earlier question around resilience, <laughs> right, is information and understanding of the issues. And I think that when we think about the insurance industry, we also have to think about it in its broad sense as an institution and all the different uh, capacities that exist within that, and how can those actually be harnessed to inform the public policy discussions that are taking place within government around understanding the risk, but also what are the options that are available to them or not. Um, and I think that these are perhaps some of the, the, to, to the, to the points, again, that you made earlier about the value of the industry and what it brings to the table that's probably not as well understood. Um, and so the risk modeling is a critical part of that, but it also extends beyond that into other realms. Mm. No, thank you, Ekwesh And that definitely resonates with the discussion we had on the last call, um, talking about the importance of the industry, the risk modeling, and also the risk mitigation. And how all this together is actually what the industry brings, in addition to the risk transfer. Perhaps, I don't know if it might be useful, but even in, we have a project, for example, in Peru, where we're working with the insurance association, um, uh, as well as the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of, uh, of, of Education, looking at structuring of, of coverage for public schools. And part of that process is not only looking at the risk financing element, but actually working with the government around issues of, you know, what are kind of the building codes that should be considered when we are thinking about rebuilding this infrastructure once it's been damaged, and we have to finance that rebuild after the fact. So I think that there are these elements that are actually quite critical if we view it from the lens of, how can the industry support resilience? Or what the industry already does, but amplifying that in current uh, public policy and public financial management conversations. Okay, I have a question now from ACAP, the Moroccan supervisor. And it is, pandemic risk is hardly appreciable and should be covered by government funds. How should a public-private partnership be implemented to cover this type of risk? So it's really just getting your thoughts on how a pandemic coverage, public-private partnership could be structured. I don't know who would like to have a first go at this question. Well, I guess I'll uh, I'll set myself up and then uh, let the other two. Um, <laughs> You're relieved, I said, aren't you, John? <laughs> um, I, I, look, I think I think. You know, one of the things that's really interesting when I look at public-private partnerships around the world, and Ekis Wade, he's seen these, you know, in many, he's worked for them in many different guises, they're all different. And I think that's one of the challenges. You know, you would think that with 15 or 16 different terrorism pools around the world, one or two of them would have been similar. Uh-uh, they're all different. Um, and my guess is that national governments looking to respond to pandemic will go with what they've already got. And so you've already seen in, in the States uh, that, you know, Congress seems to be going down the role of, in, of just taking TRIA and changing it to PRIA uh, with a 750 billion cap instead of 100 million billion cap. Um, the same will be true, I suspect, in France, where you'll see some kind of uh, AMRE-driven, Act type solution with a reinsurance into the CCR. And Spain will use its consortia vehicle. And, you know, I've already said that, you know, in England, it's definitely looking at the pool re. The, the question is the, is the design of what have we learned from public-private partnership that we can implement in future. So you just heard Ekiswehi talk about 
influencing the behavior of the person who ultimately benefits from the from the from the um you know so designing in resilience admittedly into a physical uh, situation but you know how do we design resilience into uh, against pandemic uh, how do we build back better how do we get money to the to the person that's impacted much quicker so that businesses don't go bust while they're waiting for the money so all of those kind of learnings um and I think the other thing that, you know, John alluded to mandatory offer versus mandatory purchase. Right now, you've got that challenge that I alluded to, that people aren't going to buy a product if they think the government's going to step in. So how do we, we design them a product? And how do we, as an insurance industry, design, tell them that this is a product that is worth having and will respond uh, in the event uh, that they have, a, you know, especially since the reputation of the industry is suffering so badly due to the litigation that's going on um, you know, the, 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 as we speak. And I think the other thing is, is that, you know, I think because where he said earlier about a Swiss re report, uh, you know, from I think it was 2007, if you look at the British government's risk register, the top item on the British government's risk register was pandemic. It's the number one item on the risk register. And yet look at how prepared we were for it and look at how limited the demand for the product was because you could have bought a pandemic product, I suspect. It might have cost you a lot of money, but I'm pretty sure Munich Re and Marsh would have sold you one. Um, but nobody bought it. So you had a supply side issue as well as a demand side issue. And so all of these have got to be factored in. And as way he said, and as the gentleman from America alluded to, it may be that the insurance industry doesn't have a huge amount of capital to put towards this, but it has an awful lot of expertise that it can put towards it. And it can influence the behavior of the consumer based on the design of the product. And I may add, build on that as well, um, and maybe take it back to the reputational issue that we started with on our panel discussion, uh, that here's the largest insurance of history in terms of dollars to be paid, and yet it's, it has created a significant uh, industry reputational issue. So. Uh, and to, uh, to respond a bit to my friend Steve uh, Simchak from the APPCIA, um, uh, the plan that they're uh, proposing, if you put on a spectrum, probably has less financial risk for the insurance industry. Uh, uh, another idea uh, plan that's floating is, uh, was originated from Chubb that probably represents more skin in the game for the insurance industry. And so I think that's a that's a viable discussion at a time when we're dealing with our own reputational issues. So we want to make sure that there's not further perception that, that we're distancing ourselves from from the actual risk at hand. Now there are other ways to have skin in the game in terms of reinsurance protection of, of government participation. So I'm not suggesting one over the other. I'm just saying that's a very a viable and necessary dialogue of, of where the industry wants to be perceived. And sure. Yeah, Akushway, please. Yes, I was just going to say to the question of public-private partnership should be implemented, what kind of public-private partnership should be implemented? I think if we had the solutions, <laughs> uh, we, we would all be in different spaces right now. Um, and that's precisely the point, which is that, you know, this is going to require, you know, more than one individual because no one knows what ultimately that looks like because the countries that we are dealing with, the communities and institutions, that we're dealing with also have different desires and the way in which this event is impacting them also different. So it requires a conversation to try to understand that. Um, but importantly, as was alluded to, what are the experiences that we have had? Because there are many experiences. What are the lessons that we can draw to them to allow for that innovation that is now required? And for me, that is the kind of thinking that I think we need to be open to, is to really begin to search the different corners to think about what is most appropriate for, for the particular country or region, um, et cetera. So I just wanted to add that point as well. Thank you. And then, I mean, Ekwishwe, the IDF was set up to sort of provide this useful platform for this public-private dialogue, which we've just been hearing from all three of you is needed to really discuss the different models that can be used, maybe best, best used, should we say, to try and address something like pandemic risk. Um, is, I mean, the IDF, as I say, set up against, um, climate risk. I mean, is pandemic risk now something you could see the IDF providing this public-private platform or for discussion on? Okay. Well, we're increasingly engaged around this issue because it's the dominant <laughs> conversation, as I said. And we are looking actively within our working groups 
around this. So for example, the Sovereign and Humanitarian Working Group, this is going to be part of the task of that working group to really look at what is the landscape out there? What are the kinds of innovations that are needed? Um, how can we contribute in a meaningful way, but also acutely aware of the different initiatives that are also emerging on this front? So I will say to that question, uh, absolutely the issue of pandemics will be on the idea of radar, but importantly, also keep an eye out for all the other risks that are equally <laughs> going to be as devastating or even more devastating for all of us. Um, so that's really the point that I would make. And again, an open platform to facilitate that um, because learning is an essential part of this process, just given the scale and complexity of the issues that we are trying to deal with. So that's my uh, kind of closing comments in relation to that. No, thank you, Ekushre. And we do have other questions coming in, but I'm afraid we are also running out of time. So I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and just ask the last question. And this is really in light of the fact we do have a lot of insurance supervisors on the call today. This time next week, we will have a closed call of just insurance supervisors. And the topic will be to discuss what's the insurance supervisor's role in closing the pandemic risk protection gap. So I would like to sort of hear from each of the panelists um, what roles you think insurance supervisors can play in creating an enabling environment that will encourage the private sector to step in and close the pandemic risk protection gap? Um, maybe working on my screen right to left. So, John, over to you first. Well, thank you, Hannah. Let me thank you again for allowing me to participate. So, I've been fortunate in my career. I went through 9-11. I went through the financial crisis uh, as a regulator. Um, and dealt with the, the aftermath of the regulatory changes after that, and now through uh, COVID-19. So I feel like the three major events have been hit in the, in the height of my group. But regulators, first of all, I think need to take a step back, congratulate themselves on the work they did to make sure our, our systems are safe and solvent. So we're not talking right now after a very large issues about solvency issues in, in any markets and some, most people are characterizing this as a means event, and uh, even for capital, people are able to punish the capital. So, congratulations to those regulators. And then my simple plea would be for them, for regulators to be engaged, not only at home in their home jurisdiction, but to be engaged globally on this issue. Uh, we have some great global leaders on this panel, and the more these programs can look alike, the more they'll be able to leverage uh, global, international reinsurance markets and capital and capacity like the Bermuda market. And so when these programs are, if they're all different, we're going to have problems even for the consumers uh, of knowing what's covered and what's not covered. So my plea is to think global, uh, act local. Thank you, John. Oh. Julian, what some suggestions do you have for insurance supervisors? Um, well, I guess I guess for us, uh, you know, speaking from a, a sort of um, you know parochial UK view, I think I think one of the points I made earlier was that I think the difficulty that you're going to have is persuading people to purchase, especially small businesses, uh, a, a number of different products. Uh, you know, one for terrorism, one for cyber, one for pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. So. You know, one of the, the issues about bundling, uh, which was introduced a few years ago for very good reasons, is, is one of the issues that we're going to have to deal with about whether or not we can bundle these products together. Um, uh, I think we're also going to have to look, going back to some of the points earlier about reputational, about making insurers explain very, very clearly what these products do and don't cover, uh, because I think that's one of the big learnings that we've come out from. Um, I think mandatory offer, John mentioned earlier, I think, you know, whether it's mandatory offer or mandatory to purchase kind of doesn't matter. But if you want to avoid the moral hazard post event, we need to be able to say, look, you were offered a product, you chose not to buy it, and therefore you're not eligible for compensation. Um, because otherwise, um, you know, in the situation we have you know, in the UK where you're not uh, mandated to even offer the product, uh, then compensation becomes an expected right uh, after the event. Um, and I think, you know, John's already talked about solvency, so I won't go there, but the affordability of the product, and that's the public-private partnership, is how do you, you know, affordability obviously is in the eye of the beholder, but if you want this to be a broadly taken up product, 
the government intervention, that guarantee or backstop or whatever you want to call it, is what is going to allow you to uh, move from being a risk reflective price to an affordable price to encourage take up um, and then to uh, it, it be able to influence behavior and mitigation. Thank you. And Echo Shrey, on to you then just for the final word. So okay, what, thank, you. Echo, yeah. thank you, Hannah. Um, echoing similar points from Julian as well as John on this, uh, but I will also reflect in maybe stepping a bit back to the original point that we opened with, which was really analyzing this from the issue of, okay, the protection gap. There's an acknowledgement that that is a problem and that is an issue. So what is the thinking? So it's maybe a little bit of a challenge <laughs> of the insurance regulators within that space, right, and their role. Um, and in an environment where many of our governments, our communities, our people are suffering right now, and there is a real shrinkage in terms of availability of financing. And what does the future mean in terms of security and access to coverage and insurance to help them be more resilient? So maybe, as John said, be engaged on these broader questions, <laughs> right, that are, that are out there, that others are engaging in. Um, but also in the context of we are seeing innovations within the insurance industry, parametric insurance, so all kinds of different things, use of technology, right? Um, tap into <laughs> those discussions as well, because they are going to be relevant in terms of the new kinds of solutions that are needed. And so feed into that, be aware of those developments and try to figure out how does that, what, is that, what are the implications nationally? Um, and also maybe the offer of, again, partnerships platforms such as the IDS, what you're doing through the A2II, to tap into that broader global network of what might be happening in other countries um, around regulatory issues, but just the broader question of how are we going to develop a more resilient future and the role of insurance within that. So those are kind of my, my broad asks, offers, challenges to <laughs> um, the audience. So thank you, Hannah, and uh, for organizing this um, really great session. No, thank you, Eshrache, and I mean, a lot of food for thought for our course for next week. So, yeah, thank you to, to all speakers, so to John, to Julian, to Ekoshre, to Oliver. Thank you so much for your contributions. Um, thank you for your audience, for your active participation through the chat. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions today. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, we are going to do a short poll um, to get your feedback actually on today's webinar. And the poll should now be live in the chat. So please just take a quick moment before leaving the call to fill out the poll. Um, and more generally, we'd encourage you to have a look at the A2II's website. Um, we're doing a lot of work actually to track what insurance supervisors around the globe are doing to mitigate the effects of COVID-19. So please have a look at our insurance supervisory response tracker and also our blog series. And actually, on our blog series, we will also have a summary of this pandemic risk series as well in due course, so keep an eye out for that. So with that, I would just like to close um, today's um, call. Thank you again all for your participation, your input, and I hope to have the opportunity to engage with you all again very soon. So thank you.